All right, I'm going to get started uh, since the introductions are the first thing, probably the most interesting part is going to be later. Um, who am I? Why am I here? I still don't know. I guess I am friends with Santiago, the organizer of the conference. <laughs> and um, I have been working in IT since a long time. Started when I was very young. And except uh, doing, you know, these puncture cards, I did everything from COBOL, RPG, AS400, S930, big old IBM mainframes, green letters, and, and those stuff until highly distributed services, microservices, cloud enablement, everything. I've done whatever you want to think in the middle, I've done it. I like to think of myself as a generalist that knows a little bit of everything. And in some, st in some cases, I know a lot about some very specific stuff. And um, I really enjoy delivering talks and trainings and working with customers that really pose challenges. Sometimes I really enjoy doing cultural transformation, which is very difficult, but also very rewarding. And on the personal note, um, I love to, de to teach and dance tango. Uh, I, am, I was born and raised in Argentina. And we do it together with my beautiful wife. She's here. <laughs> and um, so we also have two dogs. Uh, big dogs. Uh, one is a giant schnauzer, 47 kilograms. It stands in two legs. It's like yay high. And the other one, a very, very nice uh, boxer, uh, which is a, a small kid, like running around. It's, it's gorgeous. All right. So enough of the personal stuff. All right. So right now I'm, I'm working with uh, Fujitsu Global uh, as a part of the DTS uh, Cloud Native Services. And, um, and it has been absolutely challenging uh, because of how big Fujitsu is and how big the customers are. And I, w one of the projects that I worked, I met Istio, which is the subject of this talk. And I think it's fantastic and it's good for everybody to ha at least have it in mind. All right. I, I, before this, who worked or is working or knows or have heard about, a little bit about microservices? Probably everybody here, right? Microservices is like big topic today. Everybody's doing microservices. Oh, wow, yeah, microservices is like blockchain, right? Um, everybody knows the word, but there are very few people who actually knows what to do with it, okay? Um, microservices for me is a way to apply what I call the African lion philosophy for solving complex problem. And this is a little bit of, you know, a, story, a little bit of a story. There was this African lion who was very hungry and the only thing that has at his disposal is a big elephant, right? So the only two animals that can kill an elephant is a human being with a weapon and actually the African lion. So the African lion says, how the hell do you eat an elephant? And there comes the other African lion, the wiser one, the older one, and says, simply, one bite at a time. That's exactly what microservices are meant to. It's like solving really complex problems, breaking those problems down into very finite, into very delimited uh, uh, boundaries, and make those little bites work together. Those, that is exactly what microservices are for. It doesn't have to do anything about the size of the application, the size in terms of lines of code, of compiled size. No, a microservice can be millions of lines of code if the business logic demands it. A microservice is more about how do you break up that business problems in very delimited boundaries. This service is going to be only responsible for um, the crowd of customers. Just that. It doesn't do anything else. Just that. All right? So having this definition 
with um, microservices in mind. Remember, the word, the key word here is service. The micro is about how do you split, how do you split the problem. Service, you can have any kind of web service, and it's going to work the same with the technology that I'm going to present. But since microservices is like the buzzword today, we're going to think uh, in, in the microservice way. Probably lots of you heard about you know, why microservices are great. Microservices are great because they allow for independent, uh, highly independent, highly um, agile development teams working with a very specific piece of code that they know about the problem, they know how to solve it, and they just work in it. They code it, and that's it. They don't care about the rest of the application. They just care about the code that they need to develop. All right? Of course, you're going to find some problems that we're going to explore later, but the idea is this. is a very specific problem, solve it, then you have your service ready to go. Welcome. Uh, also, you have independent deployment. Of course, you can deploy that application. You can scale it as much as you need. You can deploy it independently from other services. If you, found, if you find a bug, you just correct it, you deploy it again to the service, and everything will keep working as before. Okay? Of course, you have scalability. Right? If you have a queue that needs to be um, scaled up because the system is having a, 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 a peak of usage, you just can scale the service that manages the queue and nothing else. You save money in that sense because you don't need more infrastructure. You just need to scale that service. Right? And reusability. Once you create a microservice, once you create a service that deals with the CRUD of um, uh, customers, you basically say, okay, each time I have to um, create a user in the database, I'm going to use the service. I don't have to replicate the logic. I just do the API call to that service, and this service is going to take all the steps necessary to create a user. Just create the call. It's, it's a delegation pattern, right? Microservices brings lots of trouble. Lots of trouble. They are not, microservices is not the solution for everybody. In fact, I would say that if you're working in a startup, if you're dealing with a startup that is working with a version that, um, that is not yet released to market, don't do microservices. Just work with a big monolithic application, extract if you need the code that needs to be highly available, and just that, because microservices are really hard. They, 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 they bring lots of troubles. First, is the development cycle can be complicated, because when you start working with these teams, these highly independent teams that take care of one thing, then what happens when that thing impacts other microservices? What's happened there? That team needs to talk to other teams. That team needs to take accountability and have the vision of working with other teams. So those other teams won't be impacted by the changes that this team is going to make in the microservice, right? It involves communication. Communication is paramount here. Deployment cycle, you have to have more CI CD tools, you have to have more pipelines, you have to have more um, um, uh, servers, containers, whatever. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a whole mess deploying a, a bunch, a fleet of microservices. Remember, you can start with two, three, four, five, six, seven microservices. Then you, from six microservices, you can grow to 36 in nothing once you start doing microservices as a philosophy. Then 36, they become probably 360. I've seen it. This is not something that you know, I'm making up. Uh, distributed transactions. Uh, that's painful. 
That's really painful. How do I know that the transaction that I'm working with these sets of microservices is actually committed to my data storage? What happens in the middle? What happens if that transaction doesn't commit? How do I revert the changes that other microservices applied? What do I do? Rollback? Not rollback. Go back to a queue for later for uh, later impact. I don't. I mean, there are many ways to solve the problem, but it's a pain in the ass, a serious pain in the ass. Uh, technical complexity, you have a lot. Um, it's this, this thing of saying, okay, guys, you have your team, use any language you want, use any database you want, use all the tools that you like, just use it, no problem at all. Uh, that can work in a small set of um, very defined working teams. When you're working with 20 teams, that's really not a wise move. Standardizing sometimes is needed because you can have, oh yeah, let's try, I don't know, Erlang. Let's do Erlang because we like it, because it's cool. And the other goal says, oh no, yeah, let's, let's use Go, Golang, because it comes from Google. And the other one goes, hey, ah, yeah, I want to do Cobalt. No. Sometimes you need to standardize things to make it actually maintainable. Because you can, if not, you cannot maintain it. If you have one team that uh, uh, is working with Golang, and uh, Golang is a hot language right now, and they get poached from another company, you will end up with a microservice that is written in Golang, and you have no one to support it. So you have to be very careful with that. Experts, experts in microservices. I have worked with microservices like a lot and I'm not cons I, I don't consider myself an expert, not by any chance. Expert, you can say, okay, Sam Newman, if you know him, uh, if, if you haven't read his book um, uh, about microservices, Sam Newman is a fantastic author. I highly recommend it. Uh, he's an expert. Matt Stein from Pivotal, he's an expert. But try to get those guys. I, I, I have some knowledge of microservices. I work with them, but it's not something that I consider myself an expert. Boundaries. How do you limit your system? It's easier when you're dealing with a new application how do you break up an existing monolithic application and put boundaries on what it does, on each functionality? How do you limit everything? Do you limit by, I don't know, by entity, by class, by function? Each company has its own, <laughs> its own philosophy in that. I, 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 don't, I don't know exactly, there, there is no answer to that. And here's, in the boundary smartness, is actually the key to the micro in microservices. The business boundary, not the technical one. Version is quite complicated. If you release a new version of your service, you have to make sure that it has backwards compatibility with existing version. If not, it's going to break contract and that will cause all the microservices that uses the microservice you deployed to break and that can cause a cascading fi failure in your system, and everything goes to hell. And that's when they call you at 2 in the morning, saying, we have a problem, and it's your work. Here's the git, get, here's the git blame, right? And it's your code there, committed, and merged into a branch, right? So version it is hard. And then again, communication. Communication is paramount. You have to communicate. You have to talk to the different teams. The different teams need to be in communication each with another because my left hand has to, has to know what my right hand is doing. If not, we can clash. Very nasty thing can, can happen. This is only the organizational aspect of microservices. We still didn't touch actually the technical stuff, right? This is very you know, floating around. So on the technical stuff, we could, we could actually think about the, the artisan way of deploying a microservice at a series of steps. Saying, for example, 
I'm deploying a microservice that has to use another service to get data from, right? So the first thing that I have to know as a service is find the service. Where's the address of the service? Do I hard code the URL of, my, of the service that I want to query? No. Bad practice. URLs can change. IPs definitely change. Do I check if it is still alive or I just do the query? How do I know that the service is available? I just do the query and wait for a timeout or do I have a process that checks for aliveness, for the liveness of the service before doing the query? How do I know that that instance of the service is free to be used? It has enough resources to take care of the request that I'm making, right? I gotta figure it out if I have permissions. It can be that the other service replies, no, you don't have permission to use. Or I could have a policy place where I can go check permissions if I have permission and then go use the service. Then I have to let the service know who am I. Why? Because if not, somebody could do a mount in the middle attack. And now we are getting into security, which is very interesting with microservices. <laughs> because you have a very wide surface of attack. So that's really complicated. Uh, actually use the service, do the query, get the data. After that, report the usage statistics, okay? That's the way you would do it like manually. If, if you were in microservices, the, source, the kind of steps that you take to just make a query, a simple query. It is quite complex. Well, I have, if it fails, okay, then, all right, let's do it all over again. Thing is that there's something that's called Istio. Istio is, is, is a thing, if you're in the microservices world, Istio is like a very big buzzword right now. And if you haven't have heard the word about Istio, you will know probably the word service mesh. Service mesh is more popular, right? And Istio is a service mesh. It's something that you actually put working with your microservices and that it solves lots of problems that if uh, you don't have Istio, you have to solve manually. You have to deploy a myriad of tools to solve that problem. <coughs> Interesting thing, it's completely open source, it's backed by Google, IBM, and Lyft. It's actually a really, a, a, the development path is really interesting. Uh, it's uh, primarily made with Golang. Um, if you're working with, if with uh, IT and systems and operations, and you don't know Golang, I highly recommend you to learn Golang. Everything is going to be made in Golang in that era. Um, currently, version is 0.8 still uh, alpha. Many of the, of the components is, are alpha, so it's not production ready, but, it's, but it works. You can do uh, proof of concepts, and you can even put it in a, in a very contained environment and, 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 and do some tests, and it will work. It will work very well, but it's still alpha, okay? You deploy it in a container orchestrator. The easiest way right now is Kubernetes. Okay, you can do it in, 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 uh, in Google with, with the GKA. You can deploy your own Kubernetes and deploy Istio. You can deploy it uh, in any, any version of flavor of Kubernetes, even Minikube. You can do it, it's quite easy to, to do it. Just a couple of commands and you're ready to go. Then it's, um, you can integrate it with console and Eureka, which are service, uh, which are software uses for service discovery. Um, so if you already have in, in your um, set of tools, console and Eureka, you can integrate it with them and you will have them working. And uh, in the roadmap is short, in shortly there's going to be support for Cloud Foundry and Apache Mesos and other container orchestrators, okay? Problems that Istio solve, and this is very important. 
Traffic management, load balancing, routing, that is taken care of by Istio. You don't have to think about putting a proxy. Istio already have some proxies. You don't have to think about routing. Istio already provides you with everything for the routing of requests. Failure recovery, also managed by Istio. You just have to set the rules, okay? Service identity and security, mutual TLS authentication, already uh, built up in Istio. You have a provider that provides with the certificates for the services, so it's very easy. You don't have to do anything else. And then you have policy enforcement, which is a very nice part we are going to take a look at, the, at it later, that um, you define the policies of the services, such as, for example, the ratio or the quota of resources that a service can use from your infrastructure or can take from another services, such as, for example, I don't want the service to go over or for 80% of the CPU for five minutes. If it goes over 80% of the CPU for five minutes, then restart the service. Just for example, that. You configure everything in Istio. All right, and then you have telemetry, which is really nice. Uh, it gets data from the uh, microservices, from the calls and the responses, and that ships that data, that telemetry data, to pretty much any system out there. You can use Prometheus, you can use Splunk, you can use, I don't know, Datadog, whatever you want. You can use it, you have adapters for that. And, you, if, and if, you not, uh, if you don't find the adapter, you can just create one. Yeah, basically a couple of IP calls, just that. Uh, the architecture of Istio. Istio is a set of services. They are microservices themselves, okay? Well, not microservices. You have, these are the components of Istio, and you can split them in two big parts. The control plane, here, in Pilot, Mixer, and Citadel, with the control plane API and the adapters, you do everything necessary to configure Istio. And it has everything necessary to um, create the state of your microservices deployment. It's the state of the microservices deployment what you want, right? And here, you have the data plane. Why is it called data plane? Because here, in this, with this envoy, which is basically a proxy, here is where the request is going to get into, get out to, go back, and go back. All the data that flows on the business logic side is here in the data plane. So, envoy. Envoy is like the main working guy of Istio. If you don't have envoy, you don't have Istio. But there are some efforts to uh, make it pluggable. So you could replace, for example, Envoy with HAProxy. So that's very interesting. If you don't like Envoy, you could use HAProxy. That's in the future. All right? Right now, it's fixed to Envoy. Envoy provides lots of things out of the box. Dynamic service discovery. Where is the service that I want to call located? Right? Load balancing. TLS works with HTTP 1 and 2 and gRPC, if you're familiar with the, with the protocols. It provides circuit breaking out of the box. If you ever work with microservices, circuit breaking is kind of really important because it prevents a cascading failure on your microservices. That provides out of the box. You don't have to implement anything. You just write a code, deploy the service, and Istio will take care of that. You just have to configure it. You don't need to write a code. Provides with health checks of the microservices. Is this microservice working? Yes? Hey, fantastic. It's not working? OK, let's go into report this. And you can configure automatic actions. What to do if a service is not working? Restart it. Take it down completely. Let the administrators know. That's your call. Uh, you can do stage rollouts. Small bits of services being deploying a little bit at a time with a percentage of derivation of traffic between the old and the new versions of the services. So that's a very powerful tool. 
With that, for example, you can do, you can do A-B testing just using Istio. You don't have to do anything in your code. You can figure it there. It's very easy. Uh, it has fault injection, which is really good if you want to simulate errors. How, do you, how, do you, how does your system uh, respond to the error? How does your system work and happens, uh, what happens if something happens? And, 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 and I got to simulate that. Because sometimes you have conditions that you cannot repeat. It, it sounds like a little bit crazy, but it happens. Sometimes you have a condition that happened one because a combination of many different things, but you have fault injection, so you can simulate errors there. That's very interesting. It's kind of, you know, are, are you familiar with the um, uh, Simian Army from Netflix? Okay, Simian Army is a small software that you deploy in your service and it starts killing servers and services. Right? So Netflix does that in production to make sure that the systems are resilient and they can recover automatically and they can continue working. It's one of the most amazing things that ever happened because that before having those errors, you just can prevent them. You, you understand on a controlled environment what's happening, you get the results, and then you prevent, and then you make the modifications necessary to prevent that from happening in the real life and having, I don't know how many gazillions of customers calling you or naming you in Twitter saying, what the fuck, this is not working, right? So this is very important. And it provides a very rich set of metrics about uh, this, um, um, the service that is a proxy. Just as a reference, this is a Kinner Severn. Uh, it's called the Envoy. It was a plane used in the Second World War, uh, developed by uh, Kinney Enterprises, a uh, transport airplane, not a war airplane. Uh, the pilot question, who can identify this? Who, who knows what it is? Please don't say it. Just who knows what it is? You know what it is? Uh, all right, all right. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Right, right, right. Okay, perfect. Um, pilot is the guy who's responsible for configuring the service discovery across the microservices. Okay? In pilot, Pilot will take the microservice deployed, will register that microservice, the IP, the port that is located, and then it's going to spread that information across all the other services. Okay? That is automatically injected. You don't have to configure that. It does traffic management. Okay? Traffic management. You can configure with Pilot, you can configure Envoy to do A-B testing, for example, or canary rollouts. Right? And then you have, of course, resiliency. You can just can configure the timeouts necessary. Um, uh, you can configure there how it's going to tolerate the faults, the secret breakers, everything. Before moving, if you haven't seen that movie, it's very old. I'm 39 years old, so kind of, you know, I know these kind of things. It's called Airplane. And it's one of the funniest movies ever made. So go watch it. Highly recommend it. Then you have Mixer. Have you ever seen this movie? A very young Tom Cruise there. Very, very young. Okay? Mixer. Mixer, what it does is, uh, is, is the guy that actually enforces the policies that you configure. The policies in usage, the policies in access. In Mixer, you configure those policies, and then the microservices will go to Mixer, will get information, and will say, okay, I can use or not use the service because of the policies. Also, is the uh, service that is um, getting all the telemetry that the Envoy proxy is sending. Okay? So it gets all the telemetry, goes to Mixer. And if, in case you don't know, this movie is Cocktail. It's called Cocktail. At least in English, I don't know here, because here they translate the movies in a very weird fashion. Uh, and then you have Citadel. If you know what this is, you can become my best friend. Probably nobody knows. All right. You're not friends of mine. Very good. So Citadel provides... Um, 
everything related to authentication. In Citadel, you're going to have your um, SSL certificates for mutual TLS authentication. The market services uh, will be deployed and Citadel will inject those uh, certificates so the microservices can do mutual TLS authentication. All right? And since you don't know what is this, this belongs to the Mass Effect game. And Mass Effect is a really amazing game. RPG style, one of my favorites, highly uh, recommended. It's an old game, so you can play it in pretty much any computer today. All right, so a very small overview on how Istio works. Because, right, we have seen all our architecture, all the things, so how does this shit work? Um, how it works is the following. We deploy our service, the service A and the service B, right? We deploy it in Kubernetes pods, which are essentially a setup of, um, uh, a, uh, how to explain it, in the, in the easiest possible way. Um, a pod is, is a set of services deployed in one VM. Let's, let's put it this way. It's a little bit more complex than that, but let's put it this way. We have service A and service B in two different pods. Istio is going to automatically, you don't have to do it, it's going to automatically inject Envoy along with that service. So what happens is that Pilot is going to talk to Envoy and is going to inject all the addresses for surface discovery, circuit breaking, everything required for this proxy to talk to this proxy. So far, you, the only thing that you did with your service is just deploy it. You don't, you didn't need, you don't need to do anything else. Once Pilot configures Envoy to talk to each other and to other uh, services, Citadel is going to inject certificates for mutual TLS and authentication. Okay? Then, what happens is that with your service, you're not going to take straight, to talk straight to the other service. You're always going to go through Envoy. Envoy acts as a proxy. That's why it sits in the middle, well, it sits in the, actually in the top of your service, okay? Then you have the net here. Here's the request, here comes the request. It goes to the entry point to Envoy. Then Envoy is actually going to say, okay, I need to do a call from service A to service B. Fantastic, good. I'm going to figure out, I'm going to mixer to check if the policies allows me to do the call from service A to service B. And since uh, Mixer uh, can provide a cache to Envoy, you don't have to go continually to Mixer. It's cached in Envoy, so it's actually a really quick thing to do. If everything goes right, then the call is made. But the call is made between the proxies, not between the services. That's the reality. Okay, so once you have this call already made, what is going to happen is that these proxies are going to go to Mixer to report the stats, the usage stats, all the metrics, okay? All right, thank you very much. If you have any other questions, we can take it outside. And I'm really sorry, my friend, that. <laughs>